Hey everyone, and welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about 13 big books that I want to read in 2022. I'm not the kind of reader to ever keep a regimented TBR. I have dozens, if not hundreds of books kind of in my mind and in various lists uh, all over the place of books and authors that I want to read. But as soon as I start putting them into a strict list, I lose interest pretty quickly. I'm pretty regimented in other parts of my life, but when it comes to my reading, I like to be as organic and free-flowing as possible. I think that I'm kind of an explorer reader in that I'll read a book and then that book will, for whatever reason, draw me to another book, either because of its similarities or occasionally I'll just pick up a book after I finish one that is just the polar opposite of the one I just finished. Because I find that creating very strict TBRs for me stifles my reading, and anything that stifles my reading, I try to get rid of pretty quickly. But I fully accept that this kind of reading can be detrimental, and the way that is most detrimental for me is I often neglect these big books. It's much easier to move freely and quickly between shorter books, but I love big, long, chunky books. And what defines a big book it's going to vary person to person. What I'm talking about here are mainly books that are over 600 pages, though some are quite a bit longer than that. Books that will take you at least 25 to 30 reading hours to get through. But though again, some of these are way longer than that. As I spoke about in my booktube newbie tag video, one of the things that really got me into reading as a kid was reading fantasy literature. And fantasy authors aren't known for writing short books. And in fact, my favorite kind of fantasy were always the epic fantasy, these big, long series in which you just get lost in this world. And I find that big, long uh, books give me a very similar sense of getting absorbed and sucked into a world um, that fantasy did for me back when I read fantasy. These long, big, maximalist books create worlds unto themselves. They construct new realities that you get sucked into and you need to figure out how to exist within that reality. And for me, there's something very different in terms of a reading experience between reading a short book that will only take you, you know, a few sittings to get through and reading a book that will take you weeks and hours and hours of your time to get through. For me, those two experiences are just very, very different. So anyways, I thought it'd be a good idea to go through 13 big books that I would like to get to in 2022. There's no order to any of this uh, or anything like that, and there are timestamps down below. But anyways, here are 13 books that I would like to get to in 2022. Number one is The Tunnel by William H. Gass. This book is clearly Gass's magnum opus. It was 30 years in the making. I think it was published in 1995, um, and it's over 600 pages. It's about a historian working with World War II. And so for lack of a better word, it sounds kind of meta in that we're not necessarily just dealing with the history, but we're dealing with a guy dealing with that history. It's a slight difference, but I often find just straightforward historical fiction, quite boring, but I love books that play with historiography and the reception of history. And it sounds like that's exactly what Gass is interested in doing. I read his Middle Sea earlier this year, um, and I just absolutely loved it. Uh, his prose style is just musical and elusive. It's everything I like in a prose style. And I found out recently that William Gass himself actually recorded an audiobook version of The Tunnel, which I'll definitely listen to as I read it. The Tunnel's been on my TBR for years. It's kind of one of the quintessential maximalist books of the 90s that I need to get to, and I think 2022 is the year to do that. Number two is Tombs of Sand by Jitanjali Shri, and translated from the Hindi by Daisy Rockwell. This is a book that I know absolutely nothing about, except that its publisher, Tilted Axis Press, has been publishing a lot of really, really cool and really interesting Asian literature in the past few years. And I've been reading quite a bit of it and enjoying a lot of it. And so when I stumbled across this, um, this was just published, I believe it came out in Hindi in 2018, and it was translated to English just earlier this year. It was published, I believe, back in the summer. When I came across this big 700-page epic Hindi book, I just couldn't resist picking it up. And I often find that Big maximalist books are often written by men. So whenever I find a very long work by a female author, especially a female author in translation, I get very excited. But apparently this book is about this old woman who, after the death of her husband, sort of re-interrogates her 
entire life philosophy. She goes back and begins reconceptualizing her life. And this book is very interested, as far as I can tell, in gender, in national history and international history, especially between India and Pakistan and stuff like that. But what really sold me was when I just read the first few lines of this book, um, which let me just read really quickly. A tale tells itself. It can be complete, but also incomplete, the way all tales are. This particular tale has a border and, and women who come and go as they please. Once you've got women and a border, a story can write itself. Even women on their own are enough. Women are stories in themselves, full of stirrings and whisperings that float on the wind that bend with each blade of grass. It just sounds brilliant. Number three is Terra Nostra by Carlos Fuentes. I haven't, somehow, I haven't read any Carlos Fuentes yet, so I know I probably shouldn't start with his biggest uh, and kind of his magnum opus, but who am I kidding? I'm going to start with his biggest work. Terra Nostra was published in the Spanish in 1975. It seems to be regarded as the Mexican maximalist novel of the 20th century. It's famously modeled on James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, and it seems to be as epic in scope as you can possibly get. It reconstructs all Mexican history and kind of all history of Hispanic culture and kind of deconstructs it and then reconstructs it. Reconstructs it. It seems very interested in, uh, again, historiography and these grand narratives that we tell ourselves. I've heard it plays with this history quite a bit as it retells and comments on this history from the 16th century onward. It sounds exactly like the kind of book that I love. Intertextual, interested in history, but more importantly, interested in the narratives of history, interested in deconstructing those narratives and reconstructing them in a new way. I really can't wait to dive into this one. I was actually very close to doing it um, last week, but then I decided to pick up Peter Nadasha's parallel stories instead. But Terra Nostra seems to be about as epic a book as you can get in terms of scope. So I'm very, very interested in picking it up and I plan to do it sooner rather than later. Number four is Kin by Miljenko Zerkovic. And this was published in the Croatian in, I believe, 2013. And again, was just translated into English just this, this year. It came out in the summer. It's translated by Russell Scott Valentino. And this is a book that immediately upon release, I picked it up and I began reading. And I got about 150 pages in, as you can tell by my tags. And I was absolutely loving this book. But then I, as I often do, unfortunately, with big books, I, I just kind of moved into other books and put it aside and kind of forgot about it. But I really want to get back to it because I loved what I got. I loved what I read. Like I just spoke about with Carlos Fuentes' Terra Nostra, Kin is also very interested in grand history. It's very interested in the grand national history of Croatia, but also the history of Europe throughout the 20th century. And what it does so well, and one of the reasons why I really liked it, and it looks at this grand national and international history through the lens of this specific family. As, as you can tell by the title, Kin, it's very interested in the family history, but it magnifies the family and expands outward to include all of Croatian uh, national history throughout the 20th century. There's a lot of really interesting autofiction going on here as Jerkovic is trying to figure out what is Croatia? What is this place that he calls home? And at least the parts that I read reminded me quite a bit in a lot of good ways um, with, uh, it reminded me of The Eighth Life by Dino Haritschavelli in the way, again, that it centers this single family, but through the family looks at a grandiose history. And of course, it's published by Archipelago Books, which is just one of the best publishers uh, around right now, and they haven't led me astray just yet, so really looking forward to getting back into that one in 2022. Number five is The Ice Trilogy by Vladimir Sorokin. These books came out throughout the uh, mid-2000s, and they were translated pretty immediately. But I think I'm becoming a Sorokin fanboy, as I read um, his The Blizzard just last month, and I absolutely loved it. Um, review to come as soon as I finish uh, reading this secondary book on Vladimir Sorkin, just so I can wrap my head around him a little bit and understand you know, the times that he is, is writing in, in Russia, because I don't really know that much about Russia, unfortunately. But I found his writing to just be so witty and so much fun. Um, it reminded me a lot of Samuel Beckett in a lot of ways, um, but with a much more postmodern um, flair to it. But the Ice Trilogy is this speculative fiction, sci-fi, 
epic trilogy that looks at, again, kind of the history of, of Russia. But it sounds like just so much fun, as so many postmodern books are. It just sounds like a wild romp through all of these different topics. It's interested in myth, science, religion. And Sorokin just blends all of these together into this web of connections that, again, so many postmodern books do. Um, but after reading The Blizzard, I just needed to read more Sorokin. And it seems like a pretty good time to get into Vladimir Sorokin as uh, NYRB by way of uh, Max Lawton, who is translating a bunch of his works. We should be getting many uh, Sorokin books within the next few years. I think there are like two books coming out uh, from NYRB um, just in 2022, but in the next five years we should be getting a lot of his work translated into English. Number six is The Books of Jacob by Olga Tarkarzik, and this is a book I don't have just yet because I'm very patiently waiting for it to be released in the U.S. Um, it's coming out in February. I was very tempted to order the Fitzcarraldo edition from the U.K., but I figured I would wait. Um, but Tarkarzak is an author I've read a bit of before. I read her Drive Your Plows Over the Bones of the Dead, and I found this book to be really incredible. It was sort of a mix of like a crime fiction thriller mixed with all of this literary criticism of William Blake. It's a really interesting book, and I've had her flights on my bookshelf for years, but I haven't gotten to yet, though my wife has read it um, and she loved it and recommended it highly. But the books of Jacob seem to be Tarkarzik's magnum opus, at least for now. It was the book most oft cited when she won the Nobel Prize just a few years ago. And I try not to do too much research on books uh, before I read them. I really don't like knowing anything about books uh, before going into reading them. But the books of Jacob seem to be about this Polish Jewish religious religious mystic and leader named Jakob Frank or Jacob Frank. And he has all these followers in 18th century Poland. And Frank just seems to be this esoteric uh, mystic. And this book seems like it touches on this really wide net of, of, of things in, in terms of, you know, it touches on history, um, religious history, enlightenment philosophy, etc. It seems Again, just like a very quintessential maximalist book. But I'm very much looking forward to that coming out in February. I, I will pick it up on release and I will probably begin reading it right away. Number seven is The Luminous Novel by Mario Levrero. This book was published, um, I believe, in Spanish in 2005, but it was only translated into English um, just this past year. Levero is a very famous, was a very famous Uruguayan author, and many consider this book um, to be one of his better books. And this is definitely the shortest book on this uh, list. I think this book is just over 500 pages, but it looks pretty dense and it looks like the kind of book that I will just get sucked into and lost into. And actually, let me just read the blurb on the back or at least the first sentence of the blurb on the back. Again, I hate reading blurbs on the back of books. I usually never do it, um, but this sounds quite good. A writer attempts to contemplate the novel for which he had been awarded a big fat Guggenheim grant, though for a long time he succeeds mainly in procrastinating. So this book see, this book sounds like it's uh, kind of based on Levero's life because he was also awarded a Guggenheim grant, um, but this writer who is writing a book while procrastinating writing a book. And to me that just sounds like something that I should read because it would be kind of funny to read a book about a writer procrastinating writing a book while I'm procrastinating writing my dissertation. But it just looks wonderful though, and I just really enjoy books about writers. Um, it sounds like, it re reminds me quite a bit of The Diaries of Emilio Renzi by Ricardo Piglia, which is a book series that I absolutely adore. And so the luminous novel seems to be in that realm of, of autofiction, which I realize isn't a very helpful term in a lot of ways, um, but I, I love books that blend the, the, the kind of auto and the fiction, for lack, lack of a better explanation. Number eight is Leg Over Leg by Ahmad Faris al Shadayak, which I'm probably mispronouncing, I do apologize. Um, but this book was originally published in Arabic in, I believe, 1855. And again, it was just only recently translated in, I believe, 2015. It's this big four volume work. Um, in this edition, it just has the first two volumes, which is about 500 pages. Um, I should have volumes three and four coming in um, in the mail in the next couple of days. So it should be all about a thousand pages for the entire set. But again, this is a book that I know almost nothing about. I'm woefully underread when it comes to Arabic literature. 
Um, I've read quite a bit of medieval Arabic like history and medieval Arabic literature, um, and I really enjoy it. But when it comes to modern Arabic, I really don't know much about it. But this book seems to be a staple in the Arabic canon. So this book is about the alter ego of the author, speaking of Ricardo Piglia and alter egos of, of authors. Um, but as, as, this, as this man uh, basically just travels throughout the Arabic world in the 19th century, it sounds rather Proustian in a lot of ways in that he's just kind of moving throughout this world and commenting on it. But everything I've read about this author uh, talks about how playful his language is and how erudite his observations are as he's both kind of satirizing and exposing the society that he, he he's, he's living in. But just listen to the opening lines of this of the first chapter. Um, it sounds just wonderful. Gently, hush, silence, quiet, cock and ear, listen up, hold your tongue, quit talking, hear, hark, hearken, and know that I embarked upon the composition of this four-book opuscule of mine during wearing grinding nights that had me praying to God, standing and seated, until finally I find no further impotent to stop the faucet of my thoughts from emptying like rain clouds into the drain pipe of my pen and onto the surfaces of these pages. It's just a brilliant opening. Number nine is America and the Cult of the Cactus Boots, a diagnostic by Philip Friedenberg. This is a book that if you are on Instagram or on YouTube, which you are, um, you've probably heard of, as so many people um, have fallen in love with this book. Both Noah at Everyone Who Reads It Must Converse and Chris over at Leaf by Leaf have done incredible videos about this book. And I can't seem to escape this book on my social media feeds. It was written in the waning years of the Trump administration, so it seems very interested sort of by nature uh, on, very interested in uh, modern politics, modern cultural trends, and everything like that. But it's also a super postmodern maximalist book that touches on everything from popular science to technology to politics, etc. It seems like Friedenberg just took everything that was in his head and just jammed it into this book, which just sounds amazing. Again, I, I love encyclopedic novels. And I've skimmed through parts and I, I love the way he plays with structure and form and there are all these wonderful illustrations by uh, Jeff Walton throughout this book. So it's playing with this form, which is something that I think more books just kind of need to do. You know, in the 21st century, I feel like reading is very, very different in a lot of ways in the age of the internet, in the age of social media. The way we engage with the written word is shifting a little bit. And I think this novel plays with that idea um, a little bit. And this book is also sort of inextricably linked to Rick Harsh's The Manifold Destiny of Eddie Vegas. Um, so when I read America and the Cult of the Cactus Boots, I'll probably have to read The Manifold Destiny as well, which I probably should have just had that book on this list. But, but either way, they both look absolutely fantastic, and I'm really looking forward to reading both The Manifold Destiny of Eddie Vegas and America and the Cult of the Cactus Boots, a diagnostic. Number 10 is The Collected Fictions of Lena Krohn, which was published in this edition in, I believe, 2015. But most of the uh, short stories and novellas um, that comprise this volume are, uh, were written in the 1980s, 90s, and, and 2000s. But Krohn is a Finnish writer who I've been wanting to get to for a really long time. Um, and this 800-page collection sounds like a pretty good place to start. Krohn is a Finnish writer who is often described as writing in the genres of, of, of speculative fiction, of sci-fi, and sort of the new weird movement. Um, this, this collection actually comes with an introduction by Jeff Vandermeer, whose fiction I occasionally like. And Krohn has been compared to authors as varied as Milan Kundera, Neil Gaiman, Tove Janssen, and Italo Calvino. And if that soup of comparisons doesn't intrigue you at least, I don't really know what you're doing. And I've also just been trying to read more Finnish literature recently as COVID pending. I should be going to Finland in the spring, but this collection just sounds so weird and bizarre and really fun. I mean, the, the first novella in here is called Donna Quixote, um, which is obviously playing with Don Quixote. So it sounds like the kind of stuff that I would like, stuff that is intertextual, that is playing with and reconstructing older stories. That's some that's stuff I just can't get enough of. Number 11 is the works of Laszlo Krasnohorkai. Um, on this list, I have 
um, Baron Venkenheim's Homecoming, or, yeah, Homecoming, uh, which is just over 500 pages, but when I think of Laszlo Krasno Horkai, um, he has said in the past that these four books from Satan Tango, uh, Melancholy of Resistance, and War is War, these four novels all work as a single novel. And so I'm thinking of this entire collection as, as a book that I want to get to. I've read a lot of Lazlo Krasna Horkais's shorter works, um, his Last Wolf and Herman, um, as well as his recent Chasing Homer, but both of these works are quite short. Um, and I've actually read Satan Tango as well, but I never got to the full, um, the full cycle. But I just love Krasna Horkais' writing style. He writes in these long, looping sentences that are just mesmerizing and hypnotic. Every time I read his works, I just get so sucked into it that I, I can't find the way back out. And honestly, that's one of the reasons why I've been putting off reading his other works for so long, is that I'm worried that they'll just suck me in and I'll only want to read Krasna Horkai for like a month straight. His books are always dreary in a way that I'm finding a lot of Hungarian literature is dreary, but I don't really read Krasna Horkai for the plot. It's his writing style that is just so addictive and so uh, in, enrapturing. He's like Thomas Bernhardt and Matthias Ennard mixed with the best parts of Joyce. I really got to get to reading more of his stuff. Um, and I think in 2022, I will do that. Number 12 is Christine Lavransdatir by Sigrid Unset, which was published originally in the Norwegian in, um, I believe, 1921, 22, and 23, or 1920, 21, 22. Um, but Sigurd Unzet is a Nobel Prize winning author from Norway, one of the most important Norwegian authors of the early 20th century. And this book is an epic historical fiction trilogy set in Norway in the 14th century. And I've actually read the first volume of this. I read it a couple of years ago, but I didn't continue on because I was at that time writing a very long chapter on uh, that touched a lot on uh, the history of 13th century Norway. So it was sort of too close to home for me to fully enjoy it. I, I really don't like reading many um, modern books that take place in the Middle Ages for that very reason. It feels too close to work for me. But this trilogy follows the character, Christine Lavransdottir, as you can probably tell, um, through just basically her daily mundane life in 14th century Norway. And what I liked so much about the first volume is how it just focused on this daily life and its focus on women as well. I think when most people think of the Middle Ages, especially in Scandinavia, um, but I guess anywhere in, in Europe, they think of men with swords. Unset isn't really interested in that at all. She's much more interested in the daily life of women, which I find to be both refreshing, but also just absorbing because you get uh, to just kind of live with her. And she lives through, I mean, at least from what I've read, pretty traumatic events, but you just get to live alongside her through all of these events. Um, it's a perfect winter read. Um, and I plan to actually pick it up probably sooner rather than later, because again, I think reading this book in winter is probably a must. And number 13 is The Seducer by Jan Scherstad. This was a book that I added to the list kind of last minute, um, but it's because I've been wanting to get to Jan Scherstad for so, so long. He is a Norwegian author, and this book is the first in a trilogy. So this book is only um, 600 pages or so, but when I'm thinking of reading Jan Scherstad, I'm going to, of course, read the full trilogy, these three books. And this trilogy was written throughout the 90s and translated into English quite quickly as it won a bunch of awards in, in Norway. But I've wanted to get to Jan Scherstad for so long because he's praised by so many authors that I adore, authors like Carla McNausgar, Jan Fossa, Vigis Hjorth. Everyone seems to really love, or at least have an opinion on Jan Scherstad. He seems to be the most important postmodern Norwegian author of the late 20th century. But the series follows a TV personality named Jonas Vergeland, who after discovering, uh, after finding his wife's body in their living room, he goes on this quest to find the killer, which sounds very Norwegian. It's, it sounds very um, crime fiction-esque, but I don't think it's necessarily just crime fiction. I think what I've heard at least is that this book is insanely encyclopedic, insanely postmodern, and uh, Sherstad brings in all of this different stuff and jams it into this trilogy. But he's an author I've been wanting to get to for so long and I've just been putting off because, again, his most famous novels are this trilogy and altogether well over a thousand pages. But 
I really, really want to get to Jan Scherstad in 2022. So yeah, that's a sort of rough TBR. Um, though, like I talked about at the beginning of the video, the chances of me following through on this uh, entirely is pretty close to zero. Um, if I wake up on a Tuesday in April and I really get the urge to finally pick up William Gaddis's The Recognitions, I'm going to do that. I really don't like following a reading schedule. Hell, I get annoyed at myself when I have to read a book for class that I assigned. So there's a good chance that I won't get through all of these, but I really hope to get to most of them. And I thought this would be a good way of to hold myself a bit more accountable. I saw um, Echo over at Echoes of Lost Library do a video similar to this where he just talked about 10 books that he wants to get to in 2022. Um, and it's a great video and that's a great channel that I highly recommend. Um, so I thought I would do something similar. So we'll see how this goes. But if you've read any of these and have thoughts you wanna share or have any advice or anything like that, um, let me know. I'd be interested to start, start talking about these books um, sooner rather than later. But for now, thanks for watching. All right, well, this turned into way more than 13 books.